he could stand it. I mean, he had the power in his speeches to move the masses. As he listens to BBC, he is immediately convinced that they're telling the truth. My friend Helmut thought that was his Christian obligation to warn the people. And then he opened the door and there comes my friend Rudy. And I said, Rudy, what are you doing here? He is the third in our group. I said, what do you mean the third? Who is the second? Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. The first thing we see is that he's emerged from some kind of a process as a full-blown anti-Nazi. He puts the prefix V-E-R on the front of the word Führer, which means that Hitler is now the seducer of the people. I opened the door and there stood two guys with that long, dark leather coat, and he lift up his lapel from the coat, and there was the badge, Geheime Staatspolizei, Gestapo. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth. The truth was deadly. Hello, and welcome to the first inaugural live stream of the Truth and Conviction series. My name is Matt Whitaker. I'm the uh, director and co-writer of the series. And as our first guest on our first live stream, uh, we have none other than the co-founder and CEO of Angel Studios, Neil Harmon. Neil, it's great to have you here. Thanks for having me on, Matt. Thank you. In fact, I was just thinking, um, not to make it overly romantic, but it feels <laughs> kind of like we finally found each other when Angel Studios and Kaleidoscope Pictures, you know, yeah, figured out, oh, you know what, we want to work together on this project, and and it might be interesting just to talk a little bit about that, um, just to the fact that our our offices are like a five minute walk apart. Yeah. And uh, and I know from our perspective, we were thinking, man, those guys down there at Angel Studios, they're doing great things. We should like try and meet them uh, and just see if there's some synergy and we could work together. I'd, I'd be interested to hear your recollection of kind of how that how that happened, how we ended up here on a live stream together. You bet. <laughs> um, do you mind if I go back a little bit Please. in time? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll start back when I watched this movie called Saints and Soldiers. Ah, yeah. And uh, I, I, a friend recommended this film to me. And, and when I watched it, I thought, wow, this is a great film. I mean, it, was, it was a wartime, World War II film that told the story of somebody who was dealing with the horrors of battle, yeah. but also held, you know, had their own faith. And they came to know somebody on the enemy's side. Um, in a real intimate way and saw them as another person yeah. and, and as another believer. And uh, just a heart-wrenching, inspiring story that was produced well, written beautifully. And I was thrilled when I found out that it wasn't a Hollywood movie because I thought it was a Hollywood movie. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then when I met John and Russ, uh, we went to Station 22 my, my partners, my yeah, par yeah. partners on the Truth and Conviction series. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so we went to Station Twenty Two right here on Center Street in, in Provo, had breakfast together, and then they said, you know, we told them about the Angel Model, um, how this is about helping the outcasts from of, of Hollywood, about letting the audience decide what they want made, right. and um, and and allowing messages that really matter to get broad distribution in the world. So we shared this vision with John and Russ and John and Russ said, you know what, we've got to do a follow-up meeting. You need to meet somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that somebody was Matt Whitaker. And mm -hmm. I, and when I, when we got into their room, it, you know, like you said, we're five minutes away in you guys office in an older library and we're in an old building. So we had that connection yeah. between us. Um, and then when I met you and found out that it was, you know, the writer of Saints and Soldiers. For me, it was a, it was a moment of um, uh, just being grateful to meet you, gra grateful for what, you know, your life had led up to, to be able to tell these stories in this way. And, and uh, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm humbled to be on this, on this journey with you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. And Saints and Soldiers, yeah, I was the screenwriter on that. That was, I'd written other scripts before that, but that was my first World War II 
story that I that I had written, and it was and it ended up ended up being a you know a really good experience. Uh, a very small film that looks like a very big film. That's right, and um, it was a, and it was a it was a very um, successful yeah. independent film. Independent yeah. films aren't very often financially successful, but right. that one was. That was right. All the investors in that one. Yep. <laughs> they were very happy that they, they were not only because yeah they made their money back and made a profit but but also because they were it ended up being a beautiful film and a story yeah. well told and and they were grateful to to have been a part of that so anyway that was kind of like my first foray foray into world war ii stories and it was just right about that same time when i found the you know the story of helmut hubner and what what he did and that was you know that for me was just once i heard from the last surviving member of this resistance group once i heard his story it's like okay it was one of those experiences where you hear a story and you go somebody should make a movie about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. right oh that's right that's what i do for a living <laughs> i'm gonna do that so so it really was a matter of saying okay we're gonna you know we're gonna make this this story i i'm curious to ask you neil you know once once we sat down at the same table mm -hmm. and said, hey, here's, here's the story of this teenager in Nazi Germany who stood up um, against Hitler and, and stood up for truth. I'm just interested to get your perspective on why you felt, I can remember you and Jeff looking at each other and going, yeah, this story. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to hear from your perspective why you felt like this was such a good fit for, for Angel Studios, for the Angel model. That's a really great question, uh, Matt. I the first thing that happened is when I realized and, and researched the story of Hubner, um, and then knowing my memory of watching uh, Saints and Soldiers and uh, experiencing that story that, that you were the screenwriter for, it was, it was like it lit a fire into me. Like, um, I know the work of Kaleidoscope Pictures and how good of work they have done previously. And they've done some World War, they've done a World War II piece before that looks beautiful. And, um, and I, I just thought, oh, wow, you know, these, these people are the creators who are meant to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, when that happens for me, um, it's, it's almost like a, a spiritual experience for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and I just get so excited. And there's something about, you know, the creative process and me and my, 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 um, appreciation for what the way in which uh, people can tell stories that I, I, I just, I just got so excited about it. And the other thing that was kind of playing into that for Jeffrey and for me is that, um, that uh, we had experienced recently in, in our society, the first signs of a desire to suppress speech that I've, mm. that I've known in, in, in my history. Um, you know, growing up, I, I grew up loving and reading about the American founding and the principles on which this country was founded. And those first principles around um, your faith and your ability to speak and to freely assemble um, all, you know, in the in the, the you know, the first um, of the Bill of Rights. I it just seems so timely to tell this story. When America has to ask itself some very hard questions about how much it truly believes in its own principles, and uh, and what better way to tell that story for this kid who put his own life on the line for what was right than for the people to say we want to see that story told. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. The fact that again that it's it is thousands and thousands of people who say yeah it's time to tell that story. Yes, and I. I just love that. It's one of the things that I, one of the many things that I love about Angel's model is the trust that you, your team genuinely puts in the crowd, you know, in, in the people saying, that's a story that we want to tell. That's why we were so grateful when we heard that, that the crowd, that the jury said, yes, we want to, we want, we want to see truth and conviction. And um, that was very gratifying, you know, to, to reach that point. Um, I, Which, yeah. if you if if, yeah. if the audience will indulge me for, yes, for one please, second, we'll indulge you. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I'll just add because because I know Matt and John and Russ won't, but we had an event recently. It was our first annual Illuminate uh, 2020, and we've decided to do an award every year on the highest rated uh, short film. We call it a torch, the highest rated torch 
um, for the year by the jury. And uh, truth and conviction, um, justly so, uh, won that award this year. And so we're we're just really happy that uh, that the that the audience has responded so well to it. Yeah, so that's fifty thousand people who are investors in Angel Studios or in different projects who have watched. Uh, who, who had the chance, I mean, we randomly select a group from them and then they have a chance to rate it after watching it. And, and it was the highest rated. That's, yeah, that was, uh, I was, I guess not surprised, but gratified, yeah. you know, I yeah. thought I've, I've known for so many years, this is a powerful story. I think, I think the world wants to hear a story like this, but when things, when you get those kind of things happening, it was, it was pretty cool. And I know that there are a lot of, of Angel Studios fans who are tuning, tuning in. And so I'm welcome. I, I, I'm grateful to have you all here as well. Um, I wanted to, I guess, kind of talk about what for me is one of the most um, important parts of the story. Um, personally, uh, was you know we have this this 16 year old kid Helmut Hubner um, and his two best friends, but he had another friend um, named Salomon Schwartz who was Jewish, and of course this is Nazi Germany and um, they all went to, to church together, actually. This is a, a young Jewish man who had converted to Christianity. And they were all they all went to church together. Um, and one day his Jewish friend, you know, was taken, was arrested by the Gestapo, and he never never saw him again. Um, that which which ended up being the catalyst for him to start his resistance movement. You know, he was seeing things before that that didn't make sense. You know, he was, his brother had smuggled home a shortwave radio, his brother who served in the German army had mm -hmm. smuggled home a shortwave radio from France mm -hmm. and it didn't work, but Helmut was this really bright kid. And so he got into, took it apart, Tinkered fixed it, it. <laughs> yeah, fixed it, and then started tuning into the BBC broadcast because the BBC at the time was broadcasting on shortwave on the, uh, in the German language. And so he was tuning in and hearing and then immediately knowing Okay, what they're telling me is the truth. What I'm hearing Goebbels say on the people's radio is propaganda, and this is the truth. So he was already getting those things, but it was when his, his Jewish friend, Solomon, was taken that that was for him the last straw. And um, I, I'd like to show everybody, we, we actually shot some concept footage, and, uh, and one of the scenes that we shot from the script was the scene when his friend, Solomon, um, just before he's being arrested, he can hear them coming, you know, coming into his home, hear his mother trying to keep them away as he's sitting in his bedroom um, and knowing that they're coming. And I just I've always can't imagine how frightening, you know, completely terrifying um, that would be to know that they're that they're coming for you. So um, I want to show everybody that scene. Um, I know that you need to go. I want to thank you so much, Neil, for, for coming. I'm so uh, grateful that, uh, to be in a partnership with Angel Studios. So thank you. Oh, the pleasure is ours. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. And um, so we'll take a look at this. This is, um, <clears throat> this is again, some proof of concept footage, uh, the scene when uh, Helmut's uh, good friend, Zalamon, was arrested. And it'll be followed by, by just a little pitch video that we did that's got... Uh, myself and my, my partners, uh, Russ Kendall and John Foss, who we'll meet in just a few minutes, uh, kind of talking in more detail about how we found the story and why we're just dedicated to, to telling it. So here's uh, Zalamon's arrest.
You've just seen the proof of concept trailer for Truth and Conviction, which will be the first dramatic series about teenage resistance fighters in Nazi Germany. It tells the true story of Helmut Hübner, who at 16 years old was willing to sacrifice his life to stand up for truth and freedom. There will be more powerful scenes to follow, but I just wanted to take a moment and invite you to join us. If you think this story should be a series, show your support. Click or visit angel.com slash truth and let us know. How did you first discover this story of Helmut Hübner? I heard about uh, an old man who was the last surviving member of a teenage Nazi resistance group named Karl Heinz Schnibbe. Heard that he lived less than an hour away from me. I just called him up on the phone, asked if he would be willing to share his story with me. He said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I went up to his house, <laughs> sat down with him, and let him just share what his experience was as a 17-year-old with his best friend, Helmut Hübner, and another friend, Rudy, 15, 16, 17 years old, standing up against Hitler. And they weren't using guns or fists to do it. They were using a typewriter. I was scared. I was actually scared because we read in the newspaper every day how severely these people get punished. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth, you know? The truth was deadly in, in Germany. But I was nosy enough to want to know more. The story that Carl told me that day um, has changed the rest of my life. I walked out of his house that day just knowing we have to make this into a movie. We have to tell this story. We've had the opportunity to become really close friends with Carl uh, over the years. He would share these experiences that he had. He would often get this distant look in his eyes. You could tell he was back in those moments. But to hear this you know, 80 year old man saying, this is what we did. You know, that brings a reality to it, that it's just not just a story, but people lived this. What came out of that was, you know, this not only we have to tell this story, but I feel entrusted to tell the story from Carl. The screenplay is, is incredibly powerful. Matt Whitaker and his writing partner, Ethan Vincent, have really captured this engaging character piece set within Nazi Germany. And it's, it's gained the attention of, of Hollywood uh, producers, including Jerry Mullen, who was the Academy Award winner for Schindler's List. He understands the power and the importance of telling stories from that era. It's really amazing to me to think, this kid was 16. He wasn't 25, he wasn't 42, he was 16 years old. I had enough to, to realize that he wasn't gonna get, he wasn't gonna give in to something that he saw was wrong. One of the most important parts of the story for me was Helmut's friendship with Zalamon Schwartz, who was Jewish. One day, Zalamon disappeared, and the Gestapo arrested him, and Helmut never saw his friend again. We went to church, to our church house, and there was a sign on the door which read, Juden is der Zutritt verboten. Jews not allowed to enter. And we had one Jewish member in our branch, Solomon Schwartz. You know, and they didn't let that young man in. He stood outside the door, and when we opened up with it, opening him, he was crying, but they didn't let him in. I wonder how I would feel if somebody took my best friend away. You know, what would I do? For Helmut, um, it was time to sit down and start typing up the truth. It wasn't too long after Helmut started typing up these leaflets and putting them out that he realized he needed help. And so he went right to his two good friends, Carl Schnibbe and Rudy Voba, and asked them to help him. Helmut said, let's make a promise. He who gets caught first takes the blame. Don't incriminate anybody. And that sounds good to me because I thought I'm cool. I was the oldest, you know. I said, they don't catch me. So I said, all right. So uh, we went that night home with uh, about uh, 15 uh, flyers, and Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. I put him in telephone booths, I put him in, in mailboxes. The following Sunday in church, he saw me coming, and he waved at me, and I waved back, and he yelled to the church, they haven't arrested you yet, have they? And, oh. I said, will you shut up? I was, <laughs> you know, so that was Helmut, joking, you know. They were dispersing these treasonous leaflets uh, throughout Hamburg, Germany. They put them in phone booths and mailboxes and sneak them into coat pockets at the opera, eluding the Gestapo for almost a year. A 
eventually, they were caught. They went to trial. At a certain point, Helmut decided he had to stand up and he had to take the attention and focus all on himself to save his two friends. And so that's exactly what he did. He stood up, he did what was right, and he let the consequences follow. Helmut was executed for standing up for truth. Carl and Rudy spent years in prison and in hard labor. An experience I'll never forget was going with Carl back to Germany and visiting some of those places where he was held as a prisoner, as a 17-year-old. But also visiting the site where Helmut was executed. And being there with Carl um, was, was truly moving. There was a busload of teenagers that pulled up with their high school teacher. And they got out and they were looking, you know, visiting this site. And he just immediately gathered all of his students around Carl and said, tell us your story. To watch Carl tell them what he had done when he was their age was so powerful. They were getting it. That for me was when a seed was really planted. I began to realize that this isn't just a powerful story. This is a story that changes people who hear it. Just another quick invite. If you want to see this story made into a series, click or visit angel.com truth to show your support. Don't worry, you're not buying or committing to anything. We just need to gauge how many of you want to be a part of bringing this story to the world. We are partnering with Baltic Films in Vilnius, Lithuania to shoot Truth and Conviction. Uh, we produced two films with them previously, and uh, we're excited to go back and, and work with a really great production partner. They previously produced HBO's Chernobyl series, as well as HBO's John Adams miniseries and the BBC's War and Peace. Another partnership we're very excited about is with Angel Studios. They've had such incredible success with the Chosen series, and we're excited to bring this project to the global audience that they've been able to reach. Our mission is to tell stories that amplify light. And when we saw the story of truth and conviction, and what that, the creators behind that story, we realized that they were gonna be able to tell a story that has those same principles that The Chosen and any other project that amplifies light. And it's a story that needs to be told today. It's a story that matters now. Helmut had big blue eyes. I mean, really big, dark blue eyes. And I never saw Helmut emotionally, you know. He never showed his emotion when, when something happened. And when I put my arms around him, I told Helmut, I see you pretty soon. His eyes filled with tears, and he said to me, I hope you have a better life and a better Germany. And then he cried. You know, we talk about stories like Helmut's story of someone sacrificing their life for someone else. I've always felt that there's like this, across humanity, it's like there's this deep connection with those kinds of stories. For me, that's what Helmut did. At some point, he must have known he was gonna be sacrificing his life to do that, right. but he did it anyway. That compels me to tell this story. I personally, I'm asking you to get this made, get it out there, let the world understand what this young German kid did in 1942. Talk to your friends and tell them. Even though he died in 1942, his example of courage, of character, of commitment, we're talking about today. I love what he's about. I want to be just like him. Thanks for watching. Help us share this powerful story to honor Helmut, Carl, and Rudy and hopefully inspire a new generation. To express your interest in this series, click now or go to angel.com truth to show your support. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking a few minutes to watch that. That, that scene with, uh, with Zalamon when he gets arrested, you know, obviously, I. I directed it, I made it. A uh, little behind the scenes information. Uh, the actor who portrayed Solomon in that uh, is my, my 
co-writer, uh, Ethan Vincent, who, with whom we wrote the script for this, for this series. Um, also a really good actor. <laughs> uh, it's always fun for me to see it. I've seen it hundreds of times, um, and yet every time I watch it, uh, it gets to me. There's something really powerful about what that must have meant. Um, so if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, go and check out angel.com slash truth. And uh, if you'd like to e express your interest um, in, in this project, uh, you know, be, this, is a, this is a good time to do that. And uh, when you go there, you'll see there's, there's a little website where you can, you can watch it. Or if you want to share this with uh, family or friends who might be interested in this kind of story, um, they'll, see, they'll be able to see right off the, the, uh, the Zalmon scene and then the pitch video that you just barely uh, were able to watch. And they'll see that, and then you can scroll down and get more information about uh, the filmmakers behind this and what kind of project this is going to be and, um, and that kind of thing. So again, I would just uh, encourage you to go check it out at angel.com slash, slash truth. Um, and uh, if you would like to, to, to pledge your support, of course, we, we really appreciate that. Um, I'm grateful, finally, you know, this is, uh, being our first live stream, live stream, it's also my first time ever doing a live stream. Um, and it was great having Neil here earlier, uh, but it's a little lonely sitting here um, by myself. So I'm going to <laughs> invite to join me uh, my two partners on this project, my, my cohorts in crime, if you will, um, Russ Kendall and John Foss, um, who have been uh, uh, with me on this journey for a long, long time. Hey, guys. Welcome. Hey, it's, uh, it's great. It's great to have you here. Um, great that the technology is working. And um, yes. uh, and I guess I, if, I, if I can, maybe just to kind of turn it over to you a, a little bit and, and let each of you explain what your roles are on this project and, and, and why you're here. Yeah, you bet. Uh, yeah, Russ Kendall, I'm producer on the film. And well, it's probably about 20 years ago. Uh, Carl's account of what he and uh, Ruth and Helmut did. And I just remember sitting out just immersed in it. and just the, the overwhelming thought just kept going through my mind of what if that was me? Would I recognize what they recognize? Would I do something about it? I was a young father at the time and I'm thinking would I put my myself in jeopardy with my family in jeopardy to stand up for what was the truth and you know hey you know i still you know I, I think we all want to think we would stand up and do what's right when you know when it's you know do or die and uh and you know from that point just compelled to tell the story and you know it was a short time later that you know matt reached out and Maybe he can tell in the really incredible way he reached out to invite me to the project. <laughs> well, here, my, my recollection is what, I had done the documentary for PBS and, and the story will not let go of me. And it's like, OK, we got to we got to we got to tell this in a, in a big way that we really get this out to the whole world. And you and I had worked together on a lot of projects over the years uh, internationally, traveled all over the world. And I just thought I. I need Russ Kendall. <laughs> I need help, and I need Russ Kendall to be a part of this. So my recollection is that I I spared no expense, and I took you out to Subway for lunch. I believe was that is that right? Yeah, I, I guess what I took from that is he's not a cheapskate. He's a director that has respect for budgets, and so <laughs> that, that's what it is. Important. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's the positive spin. I appreciate that. Yeah, but I just remember <laughs> that's where. Uh, you know, I, I just kind of laid it out and said, hey, um, do you want to go down this journey together? You know, should we make this at the time we were saying, should we make this movie? You know, and uh, thank heavens you said yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, John, what was your I'm sorry. Go ahead, Russ. No, just glad we did it. So, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, John. I know that uh, we were a little bit ways, you know, a little bit down the road when when you came on. I'm just remind me exactly kind of how that happened. Yes, well, I mean, you and Russ had created that partnership and already gone had gone down the road. I was introduced to Russ and, and Kaleidoscope Pictures a little while later uh, on another film, um, and uh, when I came in to join the team at Kaleidoscope at that time, uh, this one Huber had a bit more momentum. 
and it was and uh, I learned about the project then and and uh, felt so inspired by it I wanted to join that project too and in fact that one kind of took off for a bit so I joined the team at that time you know just shortly after um, well not shortly after but sometime after after you and Russ started going gangbusters on this um, I remember meeting Carl actually at one point I remember there was a, a social event that was downtown Salt Lake City and uh, I remember meeting him. He had, he was taller than I was, and he just had like this very soft, gentle demeanor about him. Such a, a wonderful, brilliant, kind man. And um, and I hear the stories that you two t share about him, your interactions with him, and I can, I can totally see that. Um, you know, flash forward just a little bit more uh, as I started. You know, the scripts, Matt, you've written, and you and Ethan have written different iterations of. Of the script over the years and it's it's kind of gone this direction of a of a tv series of a limited tv series now um, but i remember reading in one of those earlier drafts uh helmet looking to carl it's toward the end of of the of the story but it was like kind of in that prison moment and uh he challenged carl in, in your screenplay he challenges carl to never forget what they had done. And, it, and i think in real life carl maybe has a story that's somewhat similar to that but but those words really really stuck out to me and they really just uh kind of attached themselves to me personally because it, as you've mentioned you know uh, well carl has since passed on and 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 that story kind of still lives out there but because of that personal relationship that you and and, and, and we have had with carl it just kind of feel like that 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 challenge that charge from helmet that he gave to carl has kind of in a way come to us and i, I really felt that deeply and personally there was Ability to never forget what they did, and it's 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 a powerful story, and it's one that we've been trying to tell for for quite some time. But I'm so grateful that we are where we are now, you know, sharing this story with all of those that are watching, and and we can continue to build our audience for those who are interested in telling it. But we also have a great distribution partner with Angel, who um, has a has a great model to you know reach uh, audiences around the world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, those words um, and, you know, Carl being, the, you know, a 17 year old at the time and, and then Rudy being a 15 year old at the time, they both remember those final moments with Helmut uh, when he said uh, something to the effect of remember what we did, never forget this. And then saying you almost predicting or, or dare I say prophesying you will have a better life in a better Germany. Uh, yeah. And uh, just that that powerful, um, those powerful words, the really final words to his two best friends and uh, to never forget. And uh, Russ, I know that, you know, you and I probably, one of the greatest blessings of this whole process has been the friendship that we were able to to form with, with Carl um, over the years. What, you know, what a gift that that's been Mm. Look at that smile. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. It's just so yes. great to. There you are. Yeah, that's a, you know, it, it is one of those, one of those things, especially in trying to tell a true story uh, like this and, and to be able to, to be there with somebody who was there, you know, um, I yeah. think it's easy to, to, to forget or, or to really not understand that these things, you know, really happened. Um, and, and then to know that, um, you know, once you sit down with someone like Carl, um, who, or once you visit, you know, some of the cells with him that he was actually held in, um, you know, those are, those are very powerful moments that, that we don't forget. So, um, that for me has been one of the, one of the great rewards. Um, I see that we've got some visuals coming up. Maybe Russ, you can tell us about, you know, we're going to be shooting this in, in Vilnius, Lithuania. Actually, not it, the story took place in Hamburg, but uh, in Hamburg, Germany, but we're not shooting it in Hamburg. Maybe Russ, you want to just take a minute and talk about why we're shooting it in, in uh, Lithuania and kind of how that came about? Absolutely. Well, you know, when we started this project out, we were looking for locations that could double for Hamburg, Germany in the early 1940s. And so we scouted Germany, we scouted Romania, uh, Hungary, um, and 
you know, throughout, you know, Western Europe. Hadn't ventured too far into Eastern Europe, went to Poland, and for a time we were looking at Budapest. Um, jumped forward a couple years, and we had another feature film that we were producing that took place in, you know, 18th century Russia. And so that took us to, you know, find locations where we went to Finland, Latvia, uh, to Russia, and to Lithuania as well to, you know, try and recreate, you know, some very authentic locations for that picture. Uh, it was called Winter Thaw. And when we were there, I was staying in the old town area of Vilnius, and as I was walking the streets and, you know, just wandering around, enjoying a new city, I'm looking at this place, I'm just like, this looks like Hamburg. And I, you know, started taking pictures and sent them over to, you know, to Matt, and I said, you got to come check this out. And so Matt came yeah, over. Yeah, my recollection, my recollection was, was, dude, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> this text with these photos it's like oh yeah. my gosh you didn't even need to say what you were talking about i knew exactly what you meant you, you knew you knew and uh matt was out there um you know within a week we got him up with a location scout and he went scouting uh, this picture up right now that is an actual prison cell um very much looks like cell that uh, carl and Helmut and rudy uh, uh, held in when they were prisoners of the Gestapo in in nazi germany so a wonderful place uh, for us to, to, uh, to tell this story. And uh, we actually went back there the following year uh, for another picture, another World War II story of conviction and standing up and uh, called Instrument of War, which Matt uh, brought him on to write. Um, and uh, John and I were over so there. Uh, and again, while we were there, we we're moonlighting, looking for locations and, you know, just projecting ahead, how are we going to tell, you know, Helmut's story here? And we have a wonderful partner, which we talk about in the uh, in our uh, trailer video uh, with Baltic Film Services. Um, they are a well-oiled machine and have produced not only the pictures we've shot with them, but pictures for BBC, uh, Stranger Things season four, um, HBO's Chernobyl, and so. We've got a great partner, and they're excited about this, and and that's that's so important. Is the partners? Um, not only is this just another gig for them; they care about this story. We get regular emails from our partner there, Gary, to say, "How's the humor story coming? We got to tell this. That this has to be told." And so, having that connection and, and enthusiasm and sense of purpose from our production partner is is so cool um, and important. And again, you know, shout out to Angel and. You know, those watching, thank you um, again. It's a partnership to make this happen and to tell this story. So, appreciate it. And, and speaking of shout outs, thank you, Russ. I, I'm just seeing there that thank you to Eric, who just pledged $5,000. Uh, dude, thank you. I'm just seeing these these uh, wonderful people who are who are pledging, uh, and we're just very grateful. Nathan just pledged 500 bucks. Um, so, again, thank you. Uh, and those, if you haven't had a chance yet, go to uh, uh, angel.com slash truth. And uh, if this is something, if this is the kind of story that you, you're thinking to yourself, man, somebody should make a movie about this. Well, we're making a series about it. Um, and so I'd invite you to, to go over there and, and, and check that out. Um, something that I, something that, that is very personal to me, um, not just about this story, but about World War II in general. You, you guys both know that I'm, I'm kind of a World War II nut. Uh, and um, the reason for that, and I didn't realize this until I was a little older, but the reason for that is my dad. Um, my dad uh, was uh, part of the greatest generation. He, uh, he was a, a World War II bomber pilot. He flew B-24s, um, and that's him on the right, on the far right in that little photo. That's him when he was just a baby, um, but, uh, and on the left there. But uh, when he was, you know, 18 years old, he had... Uh, to uh, beg his mom, when Pearl Harbor got hit, he begged his mom uh, to let him, he was still 17, and he begged his mom to sign off so that he could go and, and sign up for the, to, to go and try and defend uh, liberty and freedom wherever that took him. And, um, and so she, he finally talked her into it, and, uh, and he signed up and joined the Army Air Corps and, uh, and became a, a pilot on B-24 bombers. He was based in Italy and flew missions over Austria and uh, Romania and parts of Germany. Um, and, you know, if you look at that photo, he's 20 years old piloting this, uh, um, this B-24 
big, huge beast of an airplane, you know, with, with nine or 10 other men whose lives depend on, on him. Uh, the irony for me is that when I was growing up, he didn't really talk about it that much. I mean, I knew that he was a, uh, I knew that he'd been a pilot in World War II, but again, you know, I was a teenager um, and, and it was all about me, you know? So uh, I just thought my dad was just kind of this nerdy math teacher at the local high school. Um, but every once in a while, there'd be these little glimpses that would remind me of, of what he actually had done. Um, I remember one time when I was, I think I was like 14 or 15, and I was just starting to get into what, what cars were cool and everything. And my dad didn't drive a cool car, but I was right. I was sitting with him in the car one day. We were at a stop sign, and this BMW drives past. And my, I said, now that's a cool car. And my dad said, well, what is it? And I said, it's, it's a BMW, Dad. It's a Beamer. And, and he said, oh, that, that stands for, that's Bavarian Motor Works, right? And I was stunned that my uncool dad would know that. I was like, yes, that is what that stands for. How did you know that? And he said, oh, we used to bomb them. Well, during World War II, Bavarian Motor Works was making tanks for the, for the Nazis. And so on some missions, that was, uh, that was what my dad was doing. So I would get these little reminders, you know, from time to time that uh, my dad did something that you know, that I don't fully understand. But again, he didn't talk about it much. Very typical of his generation. You know, he just didn't, he didn't say much about it. And it wasn't until he'd retired and was really in his 70s and moving into his 80s that he, that he started sharing these stories of what he had done. And I find out that he'd been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. You know, he had two purple hearts. He, you know, he just, just this amazing experience that he had being part of a team that saved the world. Um, and, uh, so then I began to understand why World War II stories meant so much to me. So, you know, when we found, when we found this story, um, I don't know, it was just something that, that spoke deep to my soul. And, uh, and I felt a connection with my father who has, has passed away now as, as most veterans of, of World War II have. Um, but, uh, as Helmut said to his friends, um, we need to remember. We need to remember what, uh, what they did, um, what so many did uh, to try and preserve freedom and stand up, stand up for what was right. Um, I don't know, it might be helpful, you guys, maybe just to talk a little bit about, um, about our influences, you know, what kind of movie we really are trying to make here, uh, what kind of a series this is going to be. Um, you know, some of the influences that, uh, I mean, I, I go and I see a film like, um, well, Schindler's List, you know, I see a film like Schindler's List and, and it was so gratifying when, uh, when Gerald Molan, the producer of Schindler's List, read our script and said, this is one of the most powerful scripts I've ever read. You guys have to make this movie. Um, you know, how can I help? Um, those kinds of things, but maybe I can just kind of throw it out to you two. What, what are some of, of your influences and you're thinking, this is the kind of story we want to tell. This is, the, this is what we want to do. I'll just throw that at you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm thinking of uh, Swing Kids, not, not necessarily that that's like totally the direction we want to go. I'm thinking about the experience that I've had when I've watched that film, and even now as a parent, because I, I'm a parent of teenagers. And uh, my daughter, who's 15 years old, she loves World War II history. Um, and uh, she's also a, a dancer. And, the, and it's watching that kind of film with her, which we haven't yet, and it, it's something I want to do. Uh, that kind of story, that kind of storytelling is something that I want to experience with my children. And um, you know, I, that's why I think of that movie, because I, I, I want this series uh, to be able to be viewed not just by you know people who love World War II stories or people who love period dramas, but this is something that I imagine the parents can watch with their children and uh, where there's some sort of uh, entertainment value to it, where they can see something uh, that a contemporary, a teenager is doing to, to stand up for what they feel is right. I mean, Helmut was standing up against institution, not just not just politically, but uh, in his community, in his religion. Uh, you know, he was standing up for what he felt was right. And um, 
and that's the that's the kind of thing that I see in a movie like Swing Kids, you know, where people are just where the kids had you know so much conviction into what they were doing. But anyway, that's a movie that just comes to mind, and as I relate it personally. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Russ, any any favorites that you feel like? Hey, we we should make it like that. <laughs> Well, I, I know the reaction of uh, my kids, especially my son Ari, uh, to you know, early teens, the preteens, and he actually he loves World War II stories and World War One. Actually, he's uh, mm -hmm. one of his favorite movies, 1917 of all, you know, which is really interesting. How old is he? and he's twelve. Wow, but, uh, that's so cool. Used to... <laughs> anyway, uh, he. It's for our kids to see something that where they can see themselves in it, I mean that's that's huge as a parent, um, and I think that's what you know we do with this. And uh, you know, it's the stories like you know Gandhi and Braveheart. These where there's this selfless sacrifice, and you know, if our kids can find somebody in media that they can look up to and resonate with, I mean that's that's huge. And um, what I'm particularly excited about with this, you know, we've talked about how it started as a feature film. Um, now doing it in a four-part series is really going to give us that opportunity to dive deeper into the motivations of of Helmut, of Carl, Rudy, and you know some of the sub characters, and really flesh out that world because it, it wasn't black and white, just good versus evil. You know, there was a great area in there of good people that maybe didn't see the truth. And we're doing, you know horrible things on their day job and came home and they were loving parents. You know, there's some really interesting, complex um, worlds and characters that we're going to explore with this um, at the heart of it being seeing through, you know, all of the, the noise that's out there and finding truth and knowing you had to do something about it. And, you know, that's what I'm hoping my kids can see and you know, get excited about. Yeah, and, I and that. I'm going to jump onto that too, because we're we're talking about we've mentioned our partnership with Angel, and uh, and I think one of the reasons why we're so excited just as creators is that the Angel model really does lend itself to the creators where we can stick to our vision, um, even at, as a distributor. They're not so much in control of of that creative per se. That they, they see the story, they trust the creators, the directors, the producers, and they're out there to tell that story to tell that um, the vision of what uh, of what the creators really want to want to say with their stories. So there's a great partnership there. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like we've been, we're so excited about that partnership is that there's mutual trust, you know, they'll trust that we're going to deliver something that, that is meaningful and important to us on a scale that's uh, on a quality scale, and they're going to do their end in, in reaching, you know, people around the world. Thank you, John. Yeah, I totally agree. And I don't know if, can you guys see these these pledges that are popping up here? I don't know if you guys can see that where you are. But Dave, thank you. Dave just pledged 500. Um, Sonia pledged 500. Uh, it's just, we're just uh, so cool to see this work. Um, I've watched other live streams, you know, Angel Studios does such a good job with them. And uh, you know, of course, I've watched like The Chosen and, and to see to see Dallas Jenkins on there and and to see all these people pledging. And even as powerful as we know that this story is, uh, there's a part of me that's like, are people really going to pledge? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh, are they, are they really going to do it? And, and to see it happening, uh, to see it working, is just great. So again, if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, go to angel.com slash truth and, um, and express your interest. If this is the kind of film that, uh, you know, this kind of series that you want to see made, um, I, would, I would invite you. To, to do that. Um, I know that some of you have been making comments and uh, in just a couple minutes, we're going to uh, uh, have a little Q and A and see if we can answer uh, uh, some of your questions, as many as, we, as many as we can. So go ahead and just put that, that comment down in, down in the notes if you can. And, and, and yeah, go ahead and, and if you can like this, uh, share it, uh, make comments below. All of those things will, will I think help uh, help this to, to get out to more people. So we, we appreciate that as well. Um, I guess now would be a good time if we want to, if, if there are any questions, 
um, that that have been uh, have been posted. Um, we'll see what we can do. See how see how well we know our. That's my shirt. Says. Um, a question shirt from says, the viewers. Yeah, the shirt says Grace. It says Grace Notes. It's actually one of the television television shows that we produce at Kaleidoscope Pictures. Russ, Russ is a producer and director of it, um, and I just like how it fits, and <laughs> it's also a really cool show. So I just I just wore it today. <laughs> That's what it is. Grace That's Notes. great. Yep. Yeah, if if you like really good Christian music and just really good inspiring music, yeah, search for Grace Notes. It's it's awesome. Thanks for the plug, man. That was great. Uh, question, another question says, can you guys expand on the storyline? Um, yeah, uh, Russ, do you want to take that on? Just to kind of what the what this story is. Sure. I mean, the writer should do it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'll interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, um, in nineteen late or 1941, at the, the height of Nazi's power, uh, Hitler's power, uh, there was no indication that they would lose. And this 16-year-old Helmut Hubner was a brilliant young man. And as Matt mentioned earlier, he got a hold of a shortwave radio and he started listening to BBC broadcasts that were in the German language that gave a very good time of the war. And he started hearing not only, you know, the Allied uh, victories, but also what, how the Allies are, you know, what casualties they uh, were uh, receiving and what was happening to the Nazis and just a very different account of the war. And he began to be, was convinced that Hitler was lying. And, you know, he was taught all his life to stand up for truth, to let the consequences follow, you know, choose what is right. And he decided to do that. And as much as he was a brilliant kid, um, his only word, uh, weapon was the typewriter. And so he started typing up flyers that, you know, very articulately denounced Hitler, uh, laying out the arguments of why Germany would lose the war and how he was deceiving the people. And, um, you know, by himself, he started dispersing these flyers and then gathered his two buddies to help him. And for about a year, they eluded the Gestapo, uh, which is the highest level of, you know, military police. I mean, just ruthless, ruthless individuals. And um, they were eventually caught, they were tortured. They were, you know, to give up you know, to say, who are you working for? Nobody believed that these teenagers were actually the ones that were typing these flyers and dispersing on their own these treasonous uh, leaflets. And they eventually realized after they found a half-written um, leaflet in Helmut's typewriter in his bedroom that this kid's actually behind this. And um, they did end up standing trial for treason in the highest court of the land called the Blood Tribunal. These were all Hitler-appointed judges. And they were all convicted of treason and uh, Helmut decided, you know, he needed to take all the blame on himself to save his friends. And um, he stood up and said, I will defend them. And uh, he was convicted of, of treason and his sentence was to be executed. And he was at the age of 17, uh, nearly 80 years ago now. So. Yeah, thank you, Russ. And, and, and it's interesting to, to look at that and, and, you know, you talked about the Gestapo and, and as uh, the writer and as I was working with my co-writer, Ethan Vincent, as we were doing research into this Gestapo agent, you know, initially Carl, as we sat down, he, he knew his last name, you know, he, he referred to him by his last name, but that's all we kind of knew. Um, but as we were doing more research and writing the script and finding out that this you know, um, this man, as you alluded to earlier, Russ, this was a really complex individual who did horrible things during the day. He would torture people for inf information. Um, but we know now that he had a wife and a family and he was, he was a loving and gentle husband and father. Um, and to, how do you reconcile that? You know, so as we were writing this script, it really became weaving these two stories together, this young resistance fighter um, and and this hardened um, Nazi who or you know and Gestapo agent who was also a, a loving husband and father and just kind of weaving these two stories together until they collide, you know. And then it's there when you know the interrogation starts that that this 16 year old kid has a huge impact on the rest of the life of this this Gestapo agent. So uh, without uh, you know giving away any spoilers. Um, it's it's an unbelievable story that really happened. So. 
Yeah, and I, I think a part of that too, Matt, is we look at these characters in our story because we have Helmut, we have his two friends, we have the Gestapo agent, we also have other supporting cast characters that the, the leader of his church, um, the mom, the wife uh, to the Gestapo agent. Um, you know, it's what this is doing and what, what I really appreciate that you've done, you and Ethan have done in the screenplay is you've, you've looked at it on a micro level. This is a character drama. This isn't like a big sweeping... World War II drama with giant planes and tanks. This is a this is going into the home. This is looking at the daily lives of these characters and looking at choices. And that's what I find so fascinating about this story is the choices that these characters are constantly making in the face of, of opposition. All of them are under some amount of pressure or some amount of expectation. And they all have to make a choice about, you know, what's going to serve them, uh, what's going to serve others, you know. And I, I, that's just what's so compelling is to watch the thought process of this kid of Helmut, who, you know, was young, was at the age of like the Nazi youth, the, the you know, the Hitler's Boy Scouts, right? He was yeah. young, indoctrinated with, with um, you know, with the politics of the time and how someone like that, like, like Helmut could come out of that, could listen to um, these broadcasts out of, you know, out of England uh, in German over the BBC radio, you know, and, and come to his own conclusion that he yeah. believed it. And then what choices he made because of that? You know, it's it's just a series of choices, just like a domino effect just throughout to, to watch how he as a character and all these other characters are affected by the truth that is slowly being revealed to them in their lives and, and what they do with it, you know. Yeah, I love that. And and uh, when people get to see this series, they will see that the way we the way we have um, constructed this, the way we've written the scripts, um, every virtually every character, major characters and minor characters, has an opportunity to decide: Are they going to stand up or not? How are they going to? What are they going to do? And it's a really you know, many of them. Not everybody did what Helmut did, but you know, there were other ways to stand up. For truth, um, and to 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 resist against uh, you know the Nazis, and uh, but it is it is a kind of an exploration into what did they do when they were faced with that choice? You know, yeah, and uh, and, and you know in them. hindsight it, it feels like it's just so obvious because we you know these kinds of stories have been told over and over again, but it's still so relevant today. There's still so much that we can pull from stories like this and kind of learn from and ask ourselves similar questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like you said earlier, Russ, what would I have done? And what do I do now? <laughs> what will I do now? Those are, those are the, some of the questions that hopefully this series will, will make all of us, all of us ask. Um, again, if you, if you haven't had a chance yet, go to angel.com slash truth. And if this is uh, the type of series that you would like to see made, uh, if you want to see this, uh, this kind of a story told, then I would invite you to, to pledge your support. Um, you know all of these 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 wonderful people who are who are pledging their support, and, and we really are grateful. Um, if I can, just for a moment, uh, you two know this, but we've been at this for a long time, um, and it's not an easy venture to to tell a um, a really powerful story uh, and to make an independent film or an independent series. Um, on, for some reason, um, it costs a lot of money. I guess everybody wants to get paid. Go figure, um, but uh, it costs a lot of money to 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 make movies. We're in it. We're in a an, an art form that uh, that isn't cheap, and uh, so uh, we're very grateful for all of you who are helping to letting the crowd speak and say, yeah, let's let's make this. Let's tell this story. Um, they are asking the question there. Where is it going to be filmed, uh, Russ? As you were saying earlier, we're we're going to be filming it in um, in Lithuania in Vilnius. Uh, we've We've shot two other films there already. Uh, we have am amazing partners, incredible locations. Uh, in some ways, it looks more like 1941 Hamburg than, than Hamburg does now. Uh, yeah. Hamburg was, was leveled practically by the bombing raids in 1943 and has been rebuilt. But um, you know, so much of it doesn't look like it did before that happened, back in 41, 42, when these boys were resisting. So be filming in, in Vilnius, Lithuania, and uh, 
it's just a, a beautiful a beautiful place to be this time we've shot two films there in the winter both times we're really mm -hmm. thinking it'd be nice to be there in the spring <laughs> yes it's beautiful there yeah i lived in the baltics for almost two years it's 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 an amazing place to be in the summer yeah there is um i don't know if there are any other questions that uh, that we need to field or or we we can try to answer if not um we will just uh invite everybody one more time we got we got one more question okay no more questions that's what the voice in my ear is saying no more questions uh so so we just uh Again, uh, want to invite everybody to, uh, if, if you can, uh, we sure appreciate it if you're able to, to share this, the, the angel.com slash truth, to, to share this, uh, this with your friends and, and family. Uh, we know there are a lot of people, and I've said this before, but you know, how many times have you, um, have you heard a story where you just think, man, somebody needs to make this into a movie? Um, and, uh, and that's why we're asking you to share it. And, and uh, we're grateful for, for those of you who have, who have tuned in. Again, another shout out to all of you um, Angel Studios fans. Um, we can feel your presence. We're, we're really grateful to have you here as well. And uh, Amen. Just, so just real quick, just because yeah. there, there may be some people on here that are not familiar with the Angel model. I mean, the, the Angel model is still new to us. As filmmakers, I mean, we've we've made movies and TV shows for networks that have provided financing, traditional studio films, even you know traditional private equity and independent film. But this is a kind of uh, this is a new venture for us that we're kind of exploring a crowdfunding um, way of financing financing this equity crowdfunding, uh, where that gives the people who express interest or later on down the road when there is a financial when there is a raise. You know, people can actually put money into the project as investors, not not just for a T-shirt, but they're going to be able to own, you know, be an owner in, in the film, as it were. So um, anyway, this is this is still kind of, you know, a new model for us. And so right now what this is doing, all these pledges coming in, it's it's really just spreading the word and letting people know what we're doing, what our intention is with this kind of story and also inviting you all to come along with us as we make this story together. Yeah, thank you, John. And, and uh, you can see on the screen there, uh, almost ninety thousand dollars in pledges today. That's just astounding. Gives me chills. Um, we're very, very grateful. Um, thank you, John and Russ. Thank you for the many years working together and looking forward to to uh, getting finally getting this puppy made. <laughs> um, and uh, and thank you to uh, all of you uh, viewers who have tuned in. Uh, and uh, all of you who have who have decided to to pledge your interest in this, uh, we're very grateful. Um, we will end this now and um, be back in a couple of weeks with our our second uh, live stream. And um, we'll just uh, wish you good night. And um, and then uh, we'll be have a chance to once again see Zalamon's scene and uh, and watch the pitch video after that. So again, to everybody, thank you, thank you very much. Well, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> See ya. You've just seen the proof of concept trailer for Truth and Conviction, 
which will be the first dramatic series about teenage resistance fighters in Nazi Germany. It tells the true story of Helmut Hübner, who at 16 years old was willing to sacrifice his life to stand up for truth and freedom. There will be more powerful scenes to follow, but I just wanted to take a moment and invite you to join us. If you think this story should be a series, show your support. Click or visit angel.com slash truth and let us know. How did you first discover this story of Helmut Hübner? I heard about uh, an old man who was the last surviving member of a teenage Nazi resistance group named Karl Heinz Schnibbe. Heard that he lived less than an hour away from me. I just called him up on the phone, asked if he would be willing to share his story with me. He said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I went up to his house, and sat down with him, and let him just share what his experience was uh, as a 17-year-old with his best friend, Helmut Hübner, and another friend, Rudy. 15, 16, 17 years old, standing up against Hitler. And they weren't using guns or fists to do it. They were using a typewriter. I was scared, I was actually scared, because we read in the newspaper every day how severely these people get punished. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth, you know? The truth was deadly in, in Germany. But I was nosy enough to want to know more. The story that Karl told me that day um, has changed the rest of my life. I walked out of his house that day just knowing we have to make this into a movie. We have to tell this story. We've had the opportunity to become really close friends with Carl uh, over the years. He would share these experiences that he had. He would often get this distant look in his eyes. You could tell he was back in those moments. But to hear this you know, 80 year old man saying, this is what we did. You know, that brings a reality to it, that it's just not just a story, but people lived this. What came out of that was, you know, this not only we have to tell this story, but feel entrusted to tell the story from Carl. The screenplay is, is incredibly powerful. Matt Whitaker and his writing partner, Ethan Vincent, have really captured this engaging character piece set within Nazi Germany. And it's, it's gained the attention of, of Hollywood uh, producers, including Jerry Mullen, who was the Academy Award winner for Schindler's List. He understands the power and the importance of telling stories from that era. It's really amazing to me to think this kid was 16. He wasn't 25, he wasn't 42, he was 16 years old. I had enough to, to realize that he wasn't gonna get, he wasn't gonna give in to something that he saw was wrong. One of the most important parts of the story for me was Helmut's friendship with Zalamon Schwartz, who was Jewish. One day, Zalamon disappeared, and the Gestapo arrested him, and Helmut never saw his friend again. We went to church, to our church house, and there was a sign on the door which read, Juden is the Zutritt verboten. Jews not allowed to enter. And we had one Jewish member in our branch, Solomon Schwartz. You know, and they didn't let that young man in. He stood outside the door, and when we opened up with it, opening him, he was crying, but they didn't let him in. I wonder how I would feel if somebody took my best friend away. You know, what would I do? For Helmut, um, it was time to sit down and start typing up the truth. It wasn't too long after Helmut started typing up these leaflets and putting them out that he realized he needed help. And so he went right to his two good friends, Karl Schnibbe and Rudy Voba and asked him to help him. Helmut said, let's make a promise. He who gets caught first takes the blame. Don't incriminate anybody. And that sounds good to me because I thought I'm cool. I was the oldest, you know. I said, they don't catch me. So I said, all right. So uh, we went that night home with uh, about uh, 15 uh, flyers. And Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer. Hitler is the guilty one. I put him in telephone booths. I put him in, in mailboxes. The following Sunday in church, he saw me coming and he waved at me and I waved back and he yelled to the church, they haven't arrested you yet, have they? And oh, I said, will you shut up? I was, <laughs> you know, so that was him with joking, you know. They were dispersing these treasonous leaflets uh, throughout Hamburg, Germany. They put them in phone booths and mailboxes and sneak them into coat pockets at the opera eluding the Gestapo for almost a year.
Eventually, they were caught. They went to trial. At a certain point, Helmut decided he had to stand up and he had to take the attention and focus all on himself to save his two friends. And so that's exactly what he did. He stood up, he did what was right, and he let the consequences follow. Helmut was executed for standing up for truth. Carl and Rudy spent years in prison and in hard labor. An experience I'll never forget was going with Carl back to Germany and visiting some of those places where he was held as a prisoner, as a 17-year-old. But also visiting the site where Helmut was executed. And being there with Carl um, was, was truly moving. There was a busload of teenagers that pulled up with their high school teacher. And they got out and they were looking, you know, visiting this site. And he just immediately gathered all of his students around Carl and said, tell us your story. To watch Carl tell them what he had done when he was their age was so powerful. They were getting it. That for me was when a seed was really planted. I began to realize that this isn't just a powerful story. This is a story that changes people who hear it. Just another quick invite. If you want to see this story made into a series, click or visit angel.com truth to show your support. Don't worry, you're not buying or committing to anything. We just need to gauge how many of you want to be a part of bringing this story to the world. Action. We are partnering with Baltic Films in Vilnius, Lithuania to shoot Truth and Conviction. Uh, we produced two films with them previously, and uh, we're excited to go back and, and work with a really great production partner. They previously produced HBO's Chernobyl series, as well as HBO's John Adams miniseries and the BBC's War and Peace. Another partnership we're very excited about is with Angel Studios. They've had such incredible success with the Chosen series, and we're excited to bring this project to the global audience that they've been able to reach. Our mission is to tell stories that amplify light. And when we saw the story of truth and conviction, and what that, the creators behind that story, we realized that they were gonna be able to tell a story that has those same principles that The Chosen and any other project that amplifies light. And it's a story that needs to be told today. It's a story that matters now. Helmut had big blue eyes. I mean, really big, dark blue eyes. And I never saw Helmut emotionally, you know. He never showed his emotion when, when something happened. And when I put my arms around him, I told Helmut, I see you pretty soon. His eyes filled with tears, and he said to me, I hope you have a better life and a better Germany. And then he cried. You know, we talk about stories like Helmut's story of someone sacrificing their life for someone else. I've always felt that there's like this, across humanity, it's like there's this deep connection with those kinds of stories. For me, that's what Helmut did. At some point, he must have known he was gonna be sacrificing his life to do that, right. but he did it anyway. That compels me to tell this story. I personally, I'm asking you to get this made, get it out there, let the world understand what this young German kid did in 1942. Talk to your friends and tell them. Even though he died in 1942, his example of courage, of character, of commitment, we're talking about today. I love what he's about. I want to be just like him. Thanks for watching. Help us share this powerful story to honor Helmut, Carl, and Rudy and hopefully inspire a new generation. To express your interest in this series, click now or go to angel.com truth to show your support.